So hi everyone, we're going to be um, talking today about uh, the topic of gender equity and uh, non-discrimination, uh, specifically in the context of uh, fair trade movement and how that fits into the fair trade movement. And the aim of this is the first in a series of sessions that we're running from the Fair Trade Association, which is all about how you can implement the principles of fair trade in your business. So we're going to get started. Um, I'll, I will talk you through, first of all, a little bit about what that all means. And uh, between six and seven, we're going to have um, some time together. In the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to um, have a chat with Kim Good, who's going to talk about how she's implemented those in her own business. So first of all, what is fair trade? So I know um, many people on the call are already familiar with the fair trade movement, but there are some people here that have joined us that are quite new. So thanks for joining. Um, fair trade aims to alleviate poverty through trade. And uh, it is a global movement that's been around um, in one form or another for over 60 years. And it's based on 10 principles uh, that are from the World Fair Trade Organization. And those 10 principles uh, you can see there, uh, opportunities for disadvantaged producers, transparency and accountability, um, fair trade practices, fair payment, no child labor, no false labor, Number six, which is what we're going to focus on today, um, non-discrimination, gender equity, freedom of association, good working conditions, capacity building, promoting fair trade and respect for the environment. So I'll just take a moment because a lot of people, when they hear fair trade, um, they immediately think tea and coffee, which is not a bad thing because fair trade tea and coffee is something that we definitely want to support. But there are a few different uh, parts to the fair trade movement. So I just wanted to put a bit of clarity around that to start with. So there are two major organizations at an international level um, that are involved in the fair trade movement. There's the World Fair Trade Organization and then there's Fair Trade International. And then at the national level, there's us, the Fair Trade Association of Australia and New Zealand, of which for those that are new here, I, I volunteer as a role of chair for the executive committee for the Fair Trade Association. And how that all fits together is the World Fair Trade Organization is really the, um, the steward for the 10 principles of fair trade and the fair trade movement globally. And they have their own guarantee system that they can guarantee that products are made fulfilling the 10 principles that I just mentioned. Fair Trade International, which is the labeling um, on the um, other side of the screen there is what you would be probably familiar with from tea and coffee. And this is, this is part of that broader fair trade movement, but it is um, based around providing, um, providing endorsement and so, so for commodity products such as tea, coffee, sugar, where you can have a much more prescribed model of, for example, what people should be paying um, for a particular product. The World Fair Trade Organization incorporates a whole bunch more stuff into, and it often includes um, handmade items. For example, this bracelet I'm wearing is made from um, rolled paper um, in Uganda by a very a small group there. So uh, fair trade isn't just tea and coffee. It can incorporate a whole bunch more stuff. And the context that we're speaking in today is in that broader context of fair trade as a movement and fair trade within those 10 principles. The other question that I get asked a lot is what is the difference between fair trade and ethical fair trade and all of the many other things um, that are out there. So one of the key things that's different about fair trade is that it focuses on providing opportunities for disadvantaged producers. And those disadvantaged producers are often in developing countries. They don't aren't necessarily, but that is often the case. And so it's often that we're working with businesses in other markets to help sell their products in wealthy markets like Australia. So what we're here to focus on today, we are having a focus session on principle six, which is about no discrimination, gender equity and freedom of association. And we thought it was a good topic to focus in on, you know, not long after International Women's Day, which was uh, in, in early March. And it was sort of top of mind for people in terms of thinking specifically about gender equity, but more broadly about um, no discrimination. And so why is this integral to fair trade? Well, the fair, this principle, principle six, states that fair trade organisations should not discriminate in hiring, remuneration, access to training, promotion, termination or retirement based on race, caste, national origin, religion, disability, gender, sexual orientation, union membership, political affiliation, HIV, AIDS status or age. So it's quite 
broad yet specific, and it covers that whole spectrum, um, ensuring that we treat each other and people fairly. So if we, if we focus in, you know, specifically on gender equity for a moment, we know that uh, less than 50% of women globally are in the labour market. And in South and West Asia and Northern Africa, it is uh, below 30%. And only 28% of managerial roles are filled by women globally. Uh, and 25% of parliamentary seats held by women. So that means that women are not as well represented as, we, as they should be in terms of in those positions of management and power across the globe. And these may be stats that you're already familiar with, but it's good to remind us of exactly what the current status is. The Fair Trade Movement also talks quite a bit about women's economic empowerment. And when we're talking about gender equity in the context of fair trade, this is a, one of the key things that fair trade really focuses on. Mm. So why is that important? Well, it's important because when women work, and as many of us who work in the for-purpose space would know, women, when you educate women, when women work, economies grow and it leads to positive um, outcomes and for their communities. So enabling women to earn their own income, it also provides them a level of security. So when we're looking at things like how to reduce violence against women, uh, providing them with the ability to have their own income gives them often the needs that they, they might require to have that independence to break free or just simply not to get into a difficult situation in the first place. And economic empowerment for both men and women um, is really important in combating modern slavery as well. If people are well employed and are being paid fairly, they're far less likely to become victims of modern slavery. So educating and upskilling our women is really important and it is key to what we're talking about here today. So when a fair trade business is looking at gender equity in their business, what we're saying is we're expecting them to have a clear policy and plan to promote gender equity equality that ensures women as well as men have equal access to resources. And I would add here that when we're talking about gender, I know that you know we're talking about the whole spectrum of gender. I'm focusing in here specifically on women, but we do mean that you know all genders are, are treated equally. So uh, we, in the context of women, we really would look for women to have the ability to influence wider policy. So in many of the disadvantaged communities that fair trade works or has worked in the past, uh, they, they do come from a much more patriarchal society even than the one we, we're in here in Australia. And so ensuring that women have the ability to have influence and to have their say is really important. And we also expect fair trade businesses, or we, we ask that fair trade businesses take into account the health and safety needs of women. And particularly in poorer communities, having access to appropriate health care, um, but also the needs of pregnant women and breastfeeding mothers who may also be needing to support um, other children as well. So childcare is a big one. So I popped this slide in here. For those of you who joined an international women's presentation day presentation with me last year, it might be familiar to you. But I think it's important to remind ourselves that gender equity is something that we also need to be thinking about here in Australia. So it's quite a funny slide, but unfortunately is true. It is um, now a few years old, and I know that things might have shifted slightly, but unfortunately not as much as you might like. But essentially what we're saying is there are more, many more men named John, Peter and David in, as CEOs and chairs of ASX countries in Australia than there are women. So it's not that there are any more men, they're all called the same names as well, which gives us a little bit of a visibility into the overall diversity of uh, leadership in these companies. So how does that compare to fair trade? Well, the really good news is that fair trade has a really well-proven model for uh, gender equity. So board positions held by women, 51%, women CEOs, 52%, and senior roles, 54%. It's a fantastic um, you know, measure when we're looking at, it, at that against the global averages, the global numbers. So the other piece that we're here to talk about today is one of the aspects of principle six is freedom of association. So what does that mean? So freedom of association, Essentially, it means that people have the right to have their say 
and they have the right to speak up when things are not going well or just simply to speak up about how things are going. And that includes specifically um, in a fair trade context to allow people and enable them to join trade unions of their choice and to bargain collectively. And if they choose to do that, that they're not then discriminated against. So this all comes together as part of this overall picture of non-discrimination. And if we, we've got a, a, a case study here in the context of you know, what, what does that actually mean? So it's, many people on this call might be familiar with the very sad Rama Plaza disaster that triggered the was, um, was when that factory burnt down in Bangladesh and it was a very sad moment. But if we look at the fashion industry, it has one of, sadly, one of the worst uh, reputations for this. So there's a lot of occupational segregation. So women are given sp specific roles that are different to men. Uh, there can also be discrimination on recruitment. So, you know, pregnancy-based discrimination is very widespread. It's a very obvious gender wage gap. Sexual harassment can be quite bad, inflexible long working hours. So these are statistics that have come out of the global garment industry um, over the past few years. And this is the sort of thing we're talking about is that workers in these situations, they need to have the right to be able to speak up without being in fear that they're going to lose their job uh, and to be able to have conversations with their employers about how to improve things. So, that's giving you a little bit of a background. Um, I really wanted to give you some context of why we're talking about this in the context of fair trade. Uh, but I'd like, I'm now going to just play a short video from Mitos Urgil, who is the CEO of Weave. And she's also the president of the World Fair Trade Organization in Asia. Excuse my poor spelling there, sorry. I just noticed that's what I'm saying. But um, let me play the video and you'll hear it directly from uh, Mitos. Uh, the Weave, Weave Foundation, or uh, otherwise known as Women's Education for Advancement and Empowerment, uh, is a refugee-powered uh, women organization and uh, which creates enabling spaces for the refugee community, in particular women, to access safe and fair employment opportunities to practices that are environmentally and socially just equitable and sustainable. And we have been doing this for more than 30 years now. And as you know, usually when refugees are displaced, they lose their roots, their culture and heritage, and often face alienation when they arrive in a new environment. So for WEAVE, it is of paramount importance to enable women refugees to reconnect to their culture and natural way of living. The ability of refugee women uh, artisans to generate safe and fair income for themselves, as well as for their community, results to self-worth and dignity. Uh, what draws me actually in the work of WIV is because it allows me, it gives me the space to contribute in the empowerment of women, uh, which is very close to my heart. Um, do you know that fair trade as a business model and a system challenges the existing gender gap? And while it is enabling uh, women, particularly the marginalized and vulnerable, to make a difference in the way things are done. So to ensure that women are equally represented, WFTO promotes girls and women in various ways. Um, and this includes setting standards to ensure non-discrimination. The fair trade system and the standards are intended to prevent gender inequality, uh, as well as increase participation and empowerment of women. And it is particularly enshrined in the 10 principles of fair trade, wherein principle number six states uh, no discrimination, promotes gender equity and freedom of association. So the WFTO standards uh, also require democratic decision-making processes that support women to have a real say in the governance of their communities and workplaces. Um, the fair trade movement also promote and train women to take leadership role at all levels. So this is really highly encouraged, particularly strengthening fair trade producers organizations 
and the fair trade enterprises. So we develop policies such as that women and men workers receive equal opportunities and benefits. So I think those are, you know, some of the areas. There are still a lot of areas actually that fair trade is, to do, is doing in order to ensure that women are really being represented. So I hope that was helpful for everyone. I think it's really great to hear from someone that's working, you know, on the front lines, so to speak, um, in the fair trade businesses in Asia and, uh, and giving you a little bit of insight into how that works uh, on the ground. So what we're really here to talk about today is how to implement this in your business. So one thing is understanding what fair trade is doing globally uh, in the context of non-discrimination and gender equity. But really today, we, we wanted to have a conversation about, well, if, if I want to be a supporter of fair trade in my business, how do I ensure that I'm practicing the 10 principles of fair trade in my business? Now, many of you may know that we have an endorsement program called the Fair Traders of Australia, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. But you don't have to be um, an endorsed fair trader of Australia to practice the 10 principles in your business. So um, fair trade is really about product, as we know. So it's about, you know, when we look at, when we think of products, I mentioned my bracelet, I mentioned tea and coffee. Um, we think about producing product using the 10 principles of fair trade. But the 10 principles of fair trade can be applied to um, many other types of businesses. And that's what we really encourage our supporters and our members to think about and, and do as well. So when you're getting started with this, there's three main things that we'd suggest you look at. The first is to develop a gender equity and non-discrimination policy. Now that's something that um, people are like, oh, write a policy, write a strategy, why is that important? But actually by simply by the act of writing something down, what is your policy on gender equity and non-discrimination? It actually forces you to stop and think about it and actually state, well, what, what do I actually mean when I say that I support gender equity and non-discrimination and what does that mean specifically in my business. Now for those of you um, on the call tonight, I did share some tools with you um, via email and for those that may not have received them, I'm happy to share them on. Um, and I have provided some examples of um, a draft policy and a template that you could use to edit and change for your own business. The second one is to combine that policy with a clear plan and timeline for achieving non-discrimination goals. So it's one thing to say that I support gender equity and I support non-discrimination, but really what we want to think about is, well, we all know that we're not there yet. You know, I would, I would question that any, anyone feels that we're, we're all absolutely working in the, you know, ticking all the boxes perfectly. It's often about an ongoing set of actions to continue to work towards and improve how we perform in these areas. So it's good to think about how, you know, if, if I say that I support this principle of gender equity, what am I actually actively doing in my business to action that, excuse me. And again, I provided a, um, a template and a sample of what that might look like. This doesn't have to be a document that's 20 pages long. It, in fact, I would suggest that it shouldn't be. It should be simple, maybe one or two pages that's very clear on some actions and guidelines with a time frame for, time frame for implementation. And the third piece is continually looking at that and seeing how you're going. And that might be just be as simple as having a measure um, across a time frame. a year is a good one, and then maybe reviewing that on a regular basis. You might want to review just regularly in your weekly meetings or catch-ups with your team, or you might want to um, think about, you know, having a set meeting specifically to review them. But just touching base and seeing how you're tracking is really good. You'll see that I've, I've made a note there. Um, people sometimes get a bit concerned that if you're actually doing something for a specific group in your business, is that classed as discrimination? But if you're, if you're preferencing particular disadvantaged groups, um, in line with your mission, that is not classed as discrimination. So if we know we want to do these things, then what should be in my policy and strategy? So this will di differ depending on your business and industry. And I mentioned that 
some people here have businesses that are based around producing product and that's you know physical product and that's a very diff different kind of approach to something that may be a service-based industry or you know you might be a marketing agency or you might provide consultancy so exactly what's in that policy uh, might differ for you but what can be helpful is to look at some key aspects that you might want to include now the, the points that i've mentioned here have been taken from some tools in the tools that I shared via email, I also shared some documents that the Australian government provides around helping people to develop these policies and strategies. And out of that, they sort of suggested focusing on a few areas and I've given five examples here that you might wish to include. So the first is professional development, for example, you might say, okay, if I believe that gender equity is important, what am I doing for professional development of all of my employees, but specifically maybe for women or specifically for other disadvantaged groups that I employ. Uh, what is what about confidential reporting? So I'm sure all of us here are very much want to ensure that we are minimizing any possibility for violence or harassment. But how do we know, um, especially in larger, larger organisations, if that is happening? And how do we ensure that our employees feel confident to stand up and speak up about that? The prevention of violence. So recognise and engage in prevention of violence. So there is, there's a lot of conversation around that at the moment in Australia with the, some of the, the, the things that have come up in the media. There's a lot of ways that you can become involved and there's actually a lot of information that you can engage with. So that might be something to think about as well. And what are your strategies and actions around that? Flexible working hours, this is a, this is a big one for a lot of people. So how do you ensure that, you know, we're talking about equity, you know, people may have different requirements for family. There may be a care of children or there may be a care of other family members like older family members. So how do we provide flexibility around that? Um, and also for people that may have different physical requirements, if they have a disability or other things that they, we need to take into account. How do we support organising? So really, this is about letting people know that that's okay, encouraging our workers and our staff to, um, to meet and discuss things and that they're able to come to you with problems as well. So in the context of fair trade, uh, we like to extend this thinking that we're thinking about in our own business to actually all of the businesses that we work with across our supply chain. And this is where I think sometimes it can feel a little overwhelming or a little bit much to think about. What I'm just going to chat a little bit about here is how to break that down a little bit um, and open up that dialogue. And it's, so that's the first thing that the first part of thinking about your suppliers and are they working in the context of gender equity and non-discrimination is to open the dialogue and ask the question. Say, what, what are you guys doing about this? This is what I think is important. What have you got in place? Start having that conversation. Now, if you are working buyers overseas in countries that might have different standards for workers, um, it is great to visit in person. Now, we all know that that's been impossible for two years, uh, but many fair traders and many fair trade people pre-COVID would have visited their suppliers at least once a year, sometimes more often than that. And that has a lot of really positive things about it. One is actually seeing for yourself what is happening on the ground. But the other part of it is actually building a relationship with your suppliers, understanding their challenges, working with them and helping them to overcome those challenges. So sometimes they might have the intentions, but they might need some help and support to implement some of the changes and that's where you can really um, get active on the ground. So you can ask them, do they have a gender policy? And you can help them put one in place. You can also simply look uh, specifically, it's what, what is the representation of women in leadership roles? So when you go over there to meet with them, are you only meeting with the men? And are the women doing the work and the men doing all the talking? And, you know, you heard uh, in, in the video that one of the things that, Fair trade is very focused on is having a collaborative model so that people actually um, make decisions in a collaborative way and, and that's very much supported in the fair trade movement. 
you can have a, a bit of a think about um, is there evidence of female advancement? So how do people move through the organisation? Is there ability for them to learn something new and to move forward? And what systems and policies are in place for women during and after pregnancy? And this is a big one, of course, um, again, in disadvantaged communities, uh, a lot of women may have a lot of kids, they may not have access to healthcare, they may, for a range of reasons, not use contraception and, and have more children than, you know, we would have in families here. So having the ability for them to continue working is, is, is important. Are you paying a living wage? So simply asking the question and having, again, having that discussion is important. I'm not going to focus too much on that here because that's another whole conversation we could have about how you assess living wage. But the World Fair Trade Organization does provide some tools and guidance on how to help assess that. And just point out here that we're talking about a living wage, not a minimum wage. And there is a little bit of a difference. A living wage means that it's a wage that people can comfortably live on in their in their country and in their community as opposed to a minimum wage which is usually or often something stipulated by a government or a, a um, you know a, or, or an organization and of course equal pay for equal work uh, that seems obvious to us in the world that we work in but it's not obvious everywhere so we want to make sure that that's in place so having these conversations with your suppliers starting that conversation um, is, is really important. So I mentioned some resources. Um, I will share this deck with everybody that is on the call. And I've included the Gender Strategy Toolkit um, in the email that I sent you. There's actually some really good resources on the government website as well. Um, but in the context of an Australian market, you know, so some of those documents might be a bit overwhelming if you're a smaller business and just wanting to look at what you can do in your own business. That's why I've provided some simpler versions uh, of a policy template and uh, example. There's also these additional resources, which I think are really worth taking a look at. So one of the things that's probably worth looking at is the gender pay gap. Uh, what are people just what are people being paid in your organization? Um, there's also some really good resources around equitable recruitment and promotion. So that's something that I'm really conscious of. The gender equitable recruitment and promotion guide is, is a good thing to look at. So one of the things that um, I've seen happen in larger organizations, for example, is they do what they call blind recruiting. So they don't show the name of the person because that helps you not to discriminate based on the name. Um, you know, with um, unconscious bias and things like that can be really good. The other thing that you can do in terms of equitable recruiting is try and, you know, it, it's difficult when you get to the decision stage to make a call, you know, look at your equitable um, stats across the business. But a good way to do it is when you're actually shortlisting people, make sure that you've got equity in the shortlist. So if you've got a list, a shortlist of four people, try and have equity of gender across that shortlist. The other thing you can look at is just in your applicants, try and look at if you're not getting a good spread of gender or a good spread of um, diversity generally, try and look at ways that you can make sure that you're recruiting from places that are going to give you the diversity that you're looking for. Uh, there's also flex flexibility around diagnostic tools and a gender equity policy. So um, that is something that's really helpful when you're writing your own. You might find that a lot of that is a bit overkill for what you need. So just, just take the pieces that you need and, and put them into your own. So that kind of gives you a bit of an overview of what we mean by principle six in the fair trade movement. It is part of this broader movement, which is, um, you know, I, I'm really passionate about, obviously, and it does have a really fantastic impact globally. Uh, there are about a million livelihoods impacted by fair trade globally. And of that, there's 355 enterprises. Now that that is the number of um, organizations impacted by those that, is, that are have the World Fair Trade Guarantee. That doesn't include all of the other people that are buying fair trade, that are working towards certification. There's is actually a much broader impact than that, which is really a fantastic thing. So before I hand over to Kim, I'm just going to mention that you can get involved in the fair trade movement. And if you wanted to join us, um, you can become a business member and a few people on the call are already business members. 
So a business member is someone that supports the movement. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's the very start of your journey. You don't have to have yet been endorsed. Um, it's just a way for you to say that you support the movement and you want to get involved. So I'd love you to join us. And that photo is actually a lovely event at sea that we had um, a couple of years ago and we did the fair trade uh, fashion parade, which was fantastic. The other thing that some people may not know about is we have fair trade communities. So, and Seed Spaces, where I'm actually presenting from, is a fair trade workplace, which is one of our communities. So communities are just that, communities that are supporters of the movement, but they are also that have fulfilled some criteria so that we endorse them as a fair trade community. So it might mean that they use fair trade products uh, within their organization. Um, it might mean that they, that they promote fair trade and help us to promote the fair trade movement. So this might be something for you to think about as your business. Um, you know, would you like to become a fair trade workplace? If you don't sell physical product, for example, but you think, wow, this is really awesome stuff. I want to be involved. You can think about becoming a workplace yourself. Just before I introduce Kim, Kim was going to join us in person, but has been hit by the um, dreaded uh, flu-like symptoms. So um, she's uh, in ISO at the moment. So she's zoomed in. So thanks, Kim, for that. Um, so Kim is the co-founder of Import Ants, who are one of our Fair Traders of Australia. Now, Fair Traders of Australia are businesses that have been endorsed by the Fair Trade Association of Australia and New Zealand as working completely within the 10 principles of fair trade. So they've ticked all those 10 boxes. And um, so Kim, first of all, maybe can you just tell us a little bit about Import Ants and your other business, Ecomax Brushes, and uh, what it is that you do? Okay, so I work mainly in Sri Lanka and we've been working there for about 13 years now. And um, we work with uh, mainly women and that produce the um, Ecomax brushes. So they're all hand twisted. Um, the group started off working with women from an area that was a slum on the outskirts of Colombo. And um, they trained the women in how to do and make the brushes and have gradually grown to be employing probably about 200 people now. Yeah, wow, that's a huge number. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if we think about the context then of the conversation tonight around gender equity, can you talk to me a little bit about what that business in Sri Lanka is doing to support to the women that are working there? The, their initial, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, you can, yep. Um, okay, they're, um, initially because they, they started with women, it was initially to um, help the women in their local community to earn an income. And um, so their main policy was to employ just women. They do now have a few men that work there. Mm -hmm. um, they're all paid equally. All the management positions within the company, apart from a couple of the people that were the original owners, starters. Um, so there's two brothers and a sister. So everybody else is actually female. And so the management, the head of the floor, the head of the production side is also a female and they all started off from the original group that were working there. Is that uh, very unusual in what, Sri Lanka? Very, right. yes, very unusual. And so how did that come um, about? Because, how did it, what was Well, it, it did start because they were looking for some way to help these women. Right. And um, at the time, the place they were in, where this local village was, it used to flood consistently. I think we can relate to that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, we can relate to that now, I know. And there was for many years an attempt to do a deal with the government to move them to higher ground. Right. Um, and there was money put aside to um, enable the women to be able to rebuild in a better position. That has happened, not, but it, it did, did take about 10 years for it to happen. And yeah, the well, way the women finally got the government to actually move them was that when the um, new expressway was built, it overlooked the slum. Wow. And they kept putting screens up so the tourists couldn't see them, which the women kept taking down and said, no, you can't hide us. That is a fantastic piece. <laughs> and um, it became yeah. such an embarrassment. 
Yes. The, yeah. the government eventually did give them some better land. Yeah. The ability to. Um, which has made a big difference. Speak up. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And they had, they had the backing of, you know, the company had put aside money, as I say, to help them because the government, in the deal, the government was to give them land and some compensation for their houses. Right. But it's never enough. So no. um, over the years, the company had put away money to give the women to help them rebuild so they could have more of the services they needed. Right. And I think you mentioned that, for example, the, there's a creche is there. Is that right? Yes. We, the the creche was an idea they've had for a long time. And um, about a year before COVID, we did manage to get it up and running. And yeah. they got a fabulous teacher in there. Um, so that ran for about a year. And then with COVID, it hasn't been able to come back because initially because they have now different village areas coming in mm -hmm. um, with COVID they had to separate them all into their different village groups so that they weren't affecting each other if one village area had a COVID running through it they were separate from the other village area and they staggered their times and you know all these different things to try and stop any um, movement of the virus within the actual facility which worked really well. Um, they did manage that. And they made sure that, you know, all the women, they organised them to be vaccinated, um, provided masks, you know. Yeah. So, in, so you know, were very, um, they, during the first lockdown, they paid their wages and all this sort of stuff, even though they couldn't work. Wow. Yeah, that's that's huge. And, and I think that's, again, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise about the fair trade movement is that there is this additional support uh, this concept of supporting people, you know, not just buying product from them when it suits us, but actually having that ongoing level of support there. You've been working with some of these women for many years now. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about one or a couple of them, you know, how they, how, you know, this, how they started um, with the organisation and, and how that's moved, moved through to now? Well, well, Mary is one of the women. She's now, um, she's in charge of production on the floor. So she oversees and makes sure that things are finished so that they're of the standard that we need in Australia. Right. And um, she start, when she started, she had three children and a husband who was gambling all the money, wow. drank a lot, um, could be abusive and things like that. And so when she first came on board with, she was one of the early ones to start there, it gave her money that she could actually then, her kids could go to school. She could feed the family and didn't have to rely on his money. Yes. So Over happy. the years, they've found that sometimes there's coercion with the men taking the money. So they've now, all the women now have their own bank accounts. So okay. their wages go directly to their account rather than getting cash at the end of the week, which is easier to be accessed by partners. Mm. That way they've got a key card and they can access it when they need it. And it's not in a ready, readily available form that the men can take off them. Um, yeah. So she's, she's now, you know, she's progressed. She's earning a, you know, a much better wage. Um, her kids, right. one of her children at university. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. So it's, it's been a huge, yeah, a huge change for her life. They, one of the girls who's recently started working, she's an mm -hmm. albino. And in the Sri Lankan community, they're quite considered not, they would very hard for them to get any work. There's a lot of discrimination against them. So she's come in there and now she works. They've taught her how to twist the brushes. And mm -hmm. she's this happy, wonderful person, part of the community there with all the women. Right. They all know her and love her. Um, so it's really improved her life and, you know, not having that discrimination in a place where she can feel safe and, and earn a proper income and, you know, which life before was her, for her quite difficult. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so, so they do try, they, um, they also have a, when, the, when it used to flood, they had a, they've got a place there where the women can come in and um, stay when the flooding happened where they right. could live there. And they've also taken in women if they've been in abusive relationships and they're having problems at home, the women and their children 
the dog, the whole bit, come and live there for a while yeah. until the women decide what it is that they want to do, you know. So it's up to them whether they want to leave their husbands or not, but it gives them that break. Yes. And so they've got a full kitchen and all that, yeah. That's all that again, type of thing. Um, so, Kim, can, one thing that I, I was hoping you could share is that, you know, when people are thinking about working with suppliers overseas, um, you know, how, how did you go about working with them to sort of implement some of these things or assess how things were happening over there? How, how did that process work for you? I think the most important thing is to visit them. Yes. Um, because no matter how much you do Skype or telephone calls or Zoom meetings, you're there on their best behaviour and yes. often you're not getting the nuances of language and you're not seeing the relationships. When I was first working in Sri Lanka, I was working with elephant dung paper and I was looking around for other products before I discovered the brushes. Yes. And um, I went to quite a lot of factories and you can get a sense instantly, you know, small workshops and things, you get a sense instantly if the people are happy. And yeah. Yeah. you know... Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite palpable. I've been to places where um, you could see the, 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 you could feel the animosity within the, the workplace and you could see um, the extent of their waste or right. how they dealt with um, dirty water or if it was going into the local stream. You could see if their toilets were clean. You know, it's amazing just things yeah. like that. If their electrical work was laid properly and not, dangerous i mean when we first went to this you know with our brush people we made changes in talking to them their electricity was really bad and we spoke to them about you know it's unsafe you know this type of electricity how you've got it connected and you know not proper power points and the leads are on the ground and you've got kids you know that will come in after school and see their parents and there's all these you know, risk factors there. So as we've grown with them and they've grown with us, those mm. things have improved. But I would never have seen that if I'd just been, you know, dealing with them normally. You also see things like it's really important to know how a product is made. Yes. Because if there are changes to prices, you can see the amount of work and why, you know, how it goes about being completed and all the processes and all the steps. Um, you get to see things like, you know, by being in a country, you can see what it costs to go and buy lunch. Yes. You know, the, the type of thing that the women working there would do to just go and buy a little, you know, pack thing that they would have for lunch. And you can see how much that costs. So Kimmy and the other factors that go into their life. So Kim, you so for example, you you might go when you were first working with an organization, either the Elephant Dung Group or this group, EcoMax Brushes that you now work with. And you might, I'm assuming when you sort of first start the relationship, you would sort of you potentially identify things that you think could improve or change. And then so you would approach them to say, hey, can we change this? And then give them suggestions or work with them on changing that. Is is that sort of how you would go about it? I'm assuming it would take some time as well. It, exactly. It does take time. I mean, those not everything that's happened all at once. Um, um, like even the question asking, like, what are your wages? When you're first going to a country like that, you haven't even done a, you know, to a place. If you haven't even done an order with them, you're not, they're like, well, who are you to ask this? Yes. Um, yes. It, you sort of have to develop that relationship. I mean, you, you get a, a feel for the place. You can see, you know, in talking to them, what they're doing in talking to the women. Um, I've taken translators with me so that I could Point. talk yeah. to the women separately from, yeah. you know, um, from, from I could just have that sort of general conversations with the women with, without the, the owners or the managers, whoever, you know, are there. And you sort of feel... If they're happy for you to speak to the the workers 
and not follow you around as if they're trying to hide something. You know, you, you yes. get that sense that they're being honest and yes. so you can develop that relationship. Um, yes. so I guess and, and then it's a matter with... of being honest with them. I mean, I tell them, yeah, I tell them exactly what, they're, what people are paying for them here and how I get to my figure. Like, so yes. they know that if they just see, you know, twenty four ninety five for a brush, which appears so much more than what I paid for it. Yeah. Even myself, when I first started, I went, my gosh, that's such a huge difference. How does that happen? Yeah. But when you actually go through the process and show them where each cost comes from to bring it up to that price, a recommended retail price, they then understand. And I asked them, what are the things, like at the moment, Sri Lanka's having terrible problems. I don't know if any of you know, um, because uh, the government has no um, American currency left because they're in such huge debt. So there are huge um, power shortages and oil and gas and, um, you know, heating um, or cooking facilities, all the things that they need. They're blackout, they're having blackouts for 10 hours a day and things like this. Wow. So I've spoken to them about that. Hmm. So I knew this was this was coming because I speak to them and say, what's impacting your life at the moment? What's going on? So you need to keep up to date with what's happening in their world in the yeah. same way as I tell them what's happening with mine. You know, that the cost of freight has tripled. Yes. The international freight. Yeah. It's building so they understand trust. what over time isn't it things are yeah. impacting my prices and i understand what things are impacting their prices yeah because they've just given their way their work as an increase to try and counteract the cost of fuel yeah okay well look we exactly we've got so to, it's an ongoing just, dialogue constantly yeah i we've got just a few minutes left i just wanted to um reach out to the people that are on the call to see if anybody has any further questions for kim um, you can pop them in the chat or you can pop your video on and just ask a question if anyone's got any questions. I have a question. Yeah, go, Karina. Thank you. Hi, Kim. How are you? Well, thanks. Hi, Karina. Hi. I'm, I'm always surprised. Um, okay, the emphasis that we, you know, we had this evening on gender equality and all the next things about women. But I'm just wondering, like in, um, in some countries, even if you want to attract males into a certain role or position, they just won't come. So you do have that, um, there is an imbalance there. So have you experienced that? Like, um, have you ever tried to attract men to work there? Or they just won't apply or they don't want to? I think <laughs> that um, the, women, the women tend to be hard workers. And I think because they have the family and they see the benefits of having money to support their family. Often the men, if they're, if they're in it, if they're in a, a, a serious, you know, if they're in poverty, sometimes they can be more demoralized, I, fi I find. They don't have the sort of family and children as the impetus to step out of it. I mean, I'm not saying that that's tr true for everybody, obviously. Mm. It does, it just, it, there, there does seem to be that when they feel demoralized, they turn to drink and alcohol and gambling. And then that it's harder to drag them out of that. Right. Whereas culturally women, you know, aren't, you know, they've got a family to support. They've got kids and they've got grandparents and, you know, the practicalities of living are left with them. And a, a bigger support network too, a social support network, women. Yeah. They're able to help each other as yes. well. Yeah. So sometimes there's um, traditional gender roles you know, I've, yes. I've seen, you know, for example, the, the men might be uh, feel that it's shameful to do something that they don't consider to be of a certain status, um, for example. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing can happen as well. There, there is that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? There is, there is very much yeah. that as well. So yeah. Uh, are there any other questions for Kim? Okay, well, I'm probably going to wrap it up there. Um, I think we're, we're right on the hour. Um, thank you, Kim. That's been really um, great conversation. And thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, I know it's very wet out there. So um, 
thanks for everyone that joined online. And uh, we'll certainly be sharing uh, a video <laughs> of this um, for everybody. And I'll share um, the, the tools and things that I've already shared as well. So thanks again. And um, yeah, speak to you soon. Thank you, Nimity.